to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be entering into today a brand new series on spiritual warfare. We're going to be taking a close look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, which really outline for us the most strategic place in all of the scripture on fighting the devil and fighting against his forces, as we will learn here this morning. And so I've entitled the series, Spiritual Warfare, and this morning's sermon is Gearing Up for the Battle. Gearing up for the battle. In your um, outline there, in your uh, bulletin, is an outline if you'd like to take notes and kind of fill in a few blanks along the way. We would invite you to do that. It might help you somewhat as we dive in this morning. So Ephesians chapter 6, again, this morning we'll only be looking at verses 10 through 13. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Father, we pray as we venture in this morning to your holy word that we would have a posture of praise. We want to praise you for your might and for your power. We praise you that the war has been won, and yet you've still called us to engage in the battle, the battle of spiritual warfare on a daily basis, God. So we pray that you would illuminate our minds, that you would captivate our hearts, that you would instruct us in our daily walk so that we could be ready to fight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, in his well-known work, The Screwtape Letter, C.S. Lewis provides a series of lessons in this uh, famous work that talk about the importance of taking a deliberate role in the Christian faith by portraying a typical human life with all of its temptations and failings, which is actually seen from the devil's point of view. And so in the work, if you're familiar with it, you have kind of the head demon who's training a younger demon in him how to attack Christians. And one of the strategies that C.S. Lewis talks about in this text would be uh, just this. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They, the devils that is, themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or magician with the same delight. Now what Lewis is saying, in case you didn't catch it, is that most Christians either A, don't really believe in the devil and in his demons, or B, they're too interested in the devil and too interested in spiritual war warfare so much that they have an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And so Lewis, I believe, accurately describes for us many Christians that exist in the church today who fall on either side of this issue. There are too many Christians who either deny the existence of the devil and his demons. Now, most of you might not say that, right? If I were to say, do you believe in the devil? You'd say, yes. Do you believe in a thing called spiritual warfare? You'd probably say, yes. If I were to ask you, how do you engage? You'd probably be like, well, uh, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I, I do, I do, I do. You know, or you have too many other Christians who, uh, who get a little bit too ex exercised about it, if you know what I mean. And everything is about the devil all the time, and so they focus their life in that way. And I, I would say that one reason for the materialist, that would be the one who practically doesn't really enter into the spiritual realm much, one reason for that is just really the state of spiritual apathy. Uh, when, 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 when the world that you live in is going well and your life is easy, you stop thinking about spiritual things and you start focusing on the physical because it's all going well for you. You don't really get to engage in the spiritual fight. And when, it, when we're like that, we often forget that millions of souls in the world are lost and in the grasp of Satan. And we kind of, kind of uh, just kind of back out of the whole spiritual warfare because we, we forget about what's really going on. It's easy to forget that Satan loves to try to take advantage of Christians who are spiritually asleep, of Christians who are lacking in their exercise and lethargic in their walk. 
Uh, maybe another reason for being unfocused on spiritual things would just be plain out worldliness. So many Christians desire temporal, earthly pleasures instead of being engaged in the fight to which we have been called. Some Christians are so nearsighted that all they want is their best life now. And they are not employing the weapons that they have been given for the battle that rages in the spiritual realm. And we must realize that we are not at peace with Satan. We are at war. This is not a time to take a nap. This is a time to raise up your arms and take action. On the other hand, too many Christians are, again, too interested in spiritual warfare that they began to see a demon behind every tree and a, and a devil behind every bush, right? I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a setting where, where if somebody's car didn't start, you would rebuke the devil, open the, the hood, get out, and I've seen people lay their hands on the car battery and say, I command you, devil, get out of this car. You think I'm kidding? It happens. People see that kind of stuff all the time to where you guys woke up all of a sudden. Some of you guys were just starting to nod off, and now they're like, oh, man, he's getting charismatic on us. All right, but that's how some people act, right? You might remember when this was at the height back in the 1990s, at the, maybe the, the, the pinnacle of the charismatic influence, there was an article in the Los Angeles Times which illustrates the obsession, which still exists, I think, in some churches today. Here's what the article said, quote, under the militant banner of spiritual warfare, growing numbers of evangelical and charismatic Christian leaders are preparing broad assaults on what they call the cosmic power of darkness. Fascinated with the notion that Satan commands a hierarchy of territorial demons, some mission agencies and big church pastors are devising strategies for breaking down the strongholds of those evil spirits alleged, alleged to be controlling cities and countries. The article goes on to say, Some proponents in this movement are already maintaining that focused prayer meetings have ended the curse of the Bermuda Triangle. That these prayer meetings have also led to the 1987 downfall and organ of the free love guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And for the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles produced a two-week drop in crime and in, in also providing a spiritual, or excuse me, a friendly atmosphere and helped unclog the freeways. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but I'm not so sure if prayer is going to unclog the freeways, right? I mean, if you want to pray that way, I mean, go for it. But I think that might be a little bit of an overemphasis and a possible abuse of the devil's work. And so many Christians go too far in their campaign to stamp out evil that they began to take on a form of spiritual warfare never authorized or encouraged by the Bible. I grew up in a church where people, if you bought a new house, you would walk into that house, anoint it with oil, and cast all the demons out of the house. That's just what you did. You you wanted to make sure that house wasn't haunted. And I'm just saying, we're in the Bible. While we want to be aware of spiritual warfare, that's what this series is all about, it is possible to be overkill in this type of mentality. In fact, for, for example, one pastor relates a confrontation he had with a demon. Here's how it went. Pastor said this, claiming my full authority over you through my union with Jesus Christ, I command you to reveal how you were able to control and gain this person's influence in their life. I hold the blood of Christ against you, and I command you to tell me. The person who apparently was demon-possessed said, she is afraid. We made her afraid. She's full of fear. The pastor then said, is that the ground you claim against this child of God? Are you able to torment and work this destruction in her life because of fear? The demon responded, yes, she is afraid all of the time. We can work through her fear. The pastor went on to bind Satan, plead the blood of Jesus, and demand the demon to leave in Jesus' name. So my question to you is, what kind of Christian are you? Are you the kind of Christian who would say, well, I believe in spiritual warfare, but I'm not really that engaged because I don't want to get loopy, all right? Or are you the kind of Christian who is literally casting demons out of fellow Christians if they seem to be afraid? Certainly, 
it is easy for us to fall off in either ditch of this road of spiritual warfare. Are you prone to laugh and scoff at those who would claim that they're fighting against Satan? Or are you submitting to God, resisting the devil and watching him flee from you? When you think of spiritual warfare, do you prefer the thought of sitting in a bunker somewhere, pushing a few buttons and bombing the the enemy from a distance? Or do you think about being engaged in a close range, hand-to-hand combat, a a true struggle that would yield blood and sweat and exhaustion? You don't have the right as a Christian just to sit back in your church and to just kind of throw out a few prayers and say, all right, we're done. We've done our warfare for the day. I think that's still a little bit more of a hand-to-hand combat that we'll see in this text. In fact, it happened to Jesus. He was involved in hand-to-hand combat with the devil. You might remember at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he went out into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit for 40 days. In Luke 4, 1 and 2 tells us this, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Now, typically, we think about that passage of the last three temptations that Christ had that we talk about. But notice it was, it was possible that it was throughout the 40 days that he was fighting the devil the whole time. He ate nothing during those days. And when they, they ended, he was hungry. Mark's gospel also adds in Mark 1.13, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was, in, uh, he was with the wild animals, and the angels are ministering to him. Now think about that for a minute. Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. He is divine, all-powerful. And yet, after 40 days of labor against temptation from the devil, the angels came and ministered to him. At the end of Jesus' ministry, a similar thing happened in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before Jesus was taken in Luke 22, 42 and following. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Two times, angels ministered to Christ. At the beginning of his ministry, when he was being tempted by the devil, and at the end of his ministry, when I believe that there was a legitimate temptation for him not to go to the cross, so much so that he was in agony and sweat, great drops of blood, and angels ministered to him both times. It's an example of Christ being engaged in spiritual warfare. So my question to you is if Jesus' ministry began and ended with spiritual warfare, what makes you think that if you are following Christ and walking in his steps, that your life won't be the same? Most Christians, when they initially become a believer, are faced with the temptation of Satan saying, oh, you didn't really mean it. You're not really a believer. That didn't really happen to you. You didn't really get converted. You just kind of got caught up in an emotional whim. You're not really a child of God. Anybody experience that? Your first year of Christian life? I did. Are you really a Christian? And as you get more involved in your Christian life and in your Christian testimony and living for Christ, a sold-out life, Satan will come and attack you time and time again. That's what this text teaches That's why we got to get ready. And so the Christian who continually seeks to grow in his knowledge and in obedience to the word of God and to serve the Lord more faithfully will not find ministry becoming any easier, but harder. As the Lord gives victory over specific temptations and weaknesses, Satan will attack in other places. Being faithful in Bible study, prayer, discipleship, and evangelism for Christ will produce spiritual fruit, but it will also invite spiritual warfare. If you are no longer struggling against the flesh, the world, and the devil, then you have either fallen into sin or into complacency. A Christian who has no hand-to-hand conflict with the forces of evil is a Christian who has retreated from from the battle and who is hiding in the bunker. Dear church, it is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to be aware. This is not a time to lay down, but a time to rise up. This is not a time to be entertained, 
but a time to engage in war. This is not a time to be overcome with fear, but to stand strong in the strength of the Lord and in his might. This morning, I want us to look at five headings that will encourage us as a church and as an individual to engage in spiritual warfare. So here's the first one. If you're taking notes again, it's in your outline. Be strong in the Lord. Notice in verse 10, that's how we kick off this final passage here of this great book. Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. And your first blank, if you are taking notes this morning, is this. Let's talk about the rest of the story. The rest of the story. And the idea here is kind of capitalizing on the word finally. So Paul's got one last thing he wants to add to everything else that's been built up in this great book of Ephesians. If we are walking in a manner worthy of our calling, Ephesians 4, 1, in humility rather than in pride, bearing with one another in love rather than attacking each other in hate, if we're putting on the new man instead of embracing the old man, if we are walking in the light rather than in the darkness, if we're walking in wisdom rather than in foolishness, if we're being filled with the Spirit instead of being drunk with wine, if we're loving our wives like Christ loved the church, and submitting to our husbands as unto the Lord, if we are leading our families in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, if we are doing our work with a sincere heart as a slave of Christ, then we can absolutely be certain that we will be attacked. You will be. It does not come easy. It does not come naturally. You cannot live the Christian life and not be attacked by the devil and by his powers. That's what the text is about. He's ending. This is the one thing Paul's saying. Make sure you understand this. Don't do it without God's power. And this is why Paul ends the letter saying, finally, the word finally could actually be translated as the rest. It could be translated as, as that which is remaining. In other words, there's one thing that he hasn't said yet that he wants to say, and he's going to say it now in verses 10 through 20. And so we see here that he gives this final farewell. The challenge is to be strong in the Lord. You cannot do it in your own strength. You must do it in his. Now, Paul had already prayed this and the famous prayer there in chapter 1 and also in chapter 3. He prayed in chapter 1 that, that, that we would uh, be able to focus on the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. He also prayed the same thing in Ephesians 3 when it said, according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power in his spirit, in your inner being. So he's already hinted at, we got to pray for this. Now he's saying, it's time to do this. Let's do this. That's what he's saying. Be strong in the Lord. This is his final message. The next blank in your outline here is the that this is going to be what I'm going to explain here in a moment. It's, gonna, it's in a, what's called a passive imperative. So the passive imperative is a gospel imperative. Let me explain what I mean. Again, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That is a command. It is an imperative. Be strong. But it's in the passive voice, which is very interesting because it's kind of like saying, hey, be strong, but you can't do it. Like God has to do that in you. It's the same imperative, imperative, the passive imperative that he used in 5.18. Remember that? In Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Same, same idea. Be filled with the Spirit, but you can't do it. The Spirit has to fill you. It has to be the Lord's work. And that's why I'm calling it a gospel imperative. You're commanded to be saved, but you cannot be saved on your own. God has to save you by his sovereign grace. He has to convict you of your sin. He has to open your eyes to the gospel. He has to grant you the ability to repent and believe. It's something you're commanded to do, but you can't do it apart from his sovereign grace. So here is this passive imperative. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This passive imperative is a gospel imperative. It's how God calls us to live all of life. And notice how he says here, be strong in the Lord. That phrase, in the Lord, is used repetitively in Ephesians. Ephesians 1.15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord. Ephesians 2.21, that you are growing together in a holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians 4.17, now this I say and testify in the Lord. Ephesians 5.8, for at one time you were in darkness, but now you are in light 
in the Lord. Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And so throughout the epistle, he's reminding us, if you're not doing it in the Lord, you're not doing it. Because it's not your strength, it is his strength. And friends, if you don't learn that every imperative is a gospel imperative, then you will get caught up into self righteousness. You will be burned out. You will get in a treadmill of your own making. You cannot do it. God's got to do it in you. How we need to remember, we're commanded to do it, but we must look to Christ knowing that only he can fill us and change us. Only he can regenerate a dead heart. If you're here today and you're suffering and you're struggling and you're going through a rough time and you're like, I just got to come to Christ, my friend, you can't come to Christ. He must come to you. He must open your eyes and give you the power to be alive in Christ. And this leads us to our next reminder here, C in the outline, the necessity of his strength. The necessity of his strength. They can be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. You cannot do it on your own. You can't do it in your own strength. You will fail. You will not get into the end zone. You will fumble. The enemy will pick up the ball and go 100 yards in the other direction and score and dance all over your game. All right? You can't do it. You will never make it in on your own. This is exactly what happens in the book of Acts. Turn there with me, if you will, to Acts 19. This is actually Paul in uh, talking there uh, uh, to some of the Ephesian people. And this occurrence, you'll remember this when you see it in Acts 19, 11 and following. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. In other words, Paul's doing such miraculous work, not Paul, but God in Paul through his servant Paul. All kind of stuff is happening. Miracles are happening. Demons are fleeing. Handkerchiefs are, are, are even touching his skin and being taken to the sick people, and they're instantly made well. And some people were watching that, thinking that's pretty cool. Verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name, uh, by, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? So we have these Jewish exorcists. There's nothing in the text that indicates they had come to Christ, that they were believers, that they were doing it in God's power. They're probably in their own strength because we see what happens. Verse 16, and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now, I don't know about you, but that's called a fight gone wrong. All right, these Jewish boys go in thinking just because they got Abraham and they got Moses and they got the Torah that somehow they're going to do work with the devil. It doesn't work that way. You don't need religion. You need a relationship with Christ. You need to be filled with the spirit of the living God and you need to fight as a Christian against the forces of evil. And if you're not doing that, you'll get whooped. You'll be embarrassed. You'll tuck your tail and run. You will be naked and bleeding because you cannot conquer spiritual forces of evil in your own strength. It must be done in the strength of the Lord and in the power of his might. That's why Jesus says, John 15, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. You got nothing. On your own, in your strength, you got zero if it's not being done in the power of his might. Which is exactly why our second heading says, put on the armor of God. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Your next blank here says the put off, put on strategy is implied. You say, Adam, what, what do you mean by that? Well, 
This word put on is the same word that's used in Ephesians chapter 4 when biblical counselors like myself and many of you love to talk about the truth that if you're not putting off bad habits and replacing them with godly habits, you're never going to change. And so look at Ephesians 4, 22. Again, it says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on, same word, put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You got to be made new. You got to put on. You, you got to first get rid of all of your self sufficiency. You got to get rid of your selfish desires. You got to get rid of, I can do it on my own. You got to get rid of sins that are tempting you, pulling you away from the battle. You got to put all that off. And you got to put something else in its place. You put on the new self. And as you put on the new self, you're also putting on the armor of God. And you got to realize here that the put on in this verse is actually in the middle voice which indicates that there is this, this idea that there is some contribution you're making by your own will and your own volition. You say, Adam, well, how does the passive work with the middle? And I would just say the idea is ultimately God's got to do it in you, but you also need to come to the point in your life where you say, you know what, I'm going to put it on. I'm going to do what he says. I, I am going to come in alignment with the word of God and with the spirit of Christ working in me. I'm going to do what it says. I'm going to put it on here. It's in the middle voice, but it also has another aspect to this verb. It's in the aorist tense, which means that it is a one-time action with a continued result. The idea is that you put it on and you leave it on. This is not in the present tense of every day. You've got to somehow suit up and put on your armor. Now, the idea is that when you come to Christ, you have the armor of God. It is put on you, and it's there to stay on. This is not like a football game where you suit up and you put on your helmet and you put on your shoulder pads and you put on your football pants and you put on your cleats and you go out into the game. And then the trainer calls you over to the sideline and he tapes up your shoes and he tapes up your gloves and he tapes up your whole body. And after the game, you're like getting cut out of all that stuff and you get rid of those shoulder pads and you take off everything else and, and you say, you know what, I don't need that equipment again until next Saturday. That's not what this is about. This is, no, you put it on one time and you leave it on. And you have it on because you're always at war. This is not just show up on Sunday armor. This is not just when I need it armor. This is I wear the armor all the time because I can't live without it. You don't take a vacation from the armor of God. You are always at war. Take your heart, for example. Your heart has been beating since the day you were born. In fact, it's been beating since you were five weeks old in the womb, right? And you, it's been beating consistently for you. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that your heart hasn't said, you know what? I've been beaten for 40 years. I think I'm going to take a minute off. In fact, I'll just take a break for the day. I'm going to take a week vacation. What would happen to you? You're dead, right? Just, just like within a couple of minutes, your life is gone. Just as your heart never stops beating, we've got to continue to be faithful to have this mindset that we need to be wearing the armor of God. And there's never a time to relax in the sense of you have to be on your guard. While you may not be relaxing, you can rest in the finished work of Christ who accomplished salvation for you on your behalf. And so if you're working, working, working in your strength, you're getting tired, you need to rest not in your strength, but in his strength. And so there's the idea there of we have to have this armor on, and we need to be reminded next in your outline, the battle is of a spiritual nature. It's of a spiritual nature. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and to take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's spiritual warfare. It's in your thinking. The battle is a battle of the mind, not of the, of the body. It's a battle of the heart, not of the emotions. It's a battle of the spirit, not of the flesh. This is where the war takes place. We're talking here, and your next blank is, we're talking about an armor that belongs to God. We're not talking about the armor of the U.S. military. Okay? We're not talking about, again, the football uniform. We're talking about here an armor of God. In fact, the word armor is used only three other times in the New Testament. Once here in this passage in verse 13 where it says, 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That's two of the four times it's used in the Bible. The other time is in Luke chapter 11 in a context of spiritual warfare. Right after Jesus had cast a demon out of a man that was mute, he was accused of casting out demons in the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And if you remember what Jesus said, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So in other words, people are like, man, what's this guy doing? He's casting out demons. He must be doing that as a magician. Jesus is like, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm doing this by the power of God. And if I'm doing it by the power of God, the kingdom of God has arrived in the person of Christ. And then he goes on to say this. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger, then he attacks him and overcomes him. He takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Now, again, we don't have time to look at that in detail, but here's what Jesus is saying. Satan is the strong man, and he's got armor. But when Jesus comes in, who's stronger, and he removes the armor of Satan, then Christ is victorious, and he divides the spoil. And the idea is, in order to get to somebody, you got to get their armor off. And the idea here in Ephesians 6 is, you better never take it off. You better have your armor on. Don't you ever let anybody take it off. You keep your armor on because in Christ, you are stronger. You see, Satan's a strong man, but you're stronger in Christ. The only other reference to the word armor is a little different word, but it's in Romans 13, 12, and it refers to the works of darkness, and then it says, put on the armor of light. So we are wearing God's armor. There's a cross-reference in that Romans 13 passage, which actually leads us back to Ephesians 6. And so the idea here, again, is that we need to be wearing God's armor. We need to be wearing the armor of light, and we can't ever take it off. And so let me ask you, how are you doing, church? Do you have your armor on? Are you taking it off? Are you wearing it at all times? Or do you think sometimes it's time to be on vacation? A little bit over a year ago, I met with a gentleman who works for the uh, parking enforcement of Santa Clarita. We were meeting together for lunch, and when we walked into the place for lunch, I noticed he looked like he had gained a few pounds. And I looked a little bit closer, and I realized he had on a bulletproof vest. And I looked even closer, and I'm like, he didn't have a gun. He's wearing a bulletproof vest. He's a parking enforcement officer. And I kind of made light of it a little bit. I'm like, hey, man, why are you wearing a bulletproof vest? And he's like, you know what? You never know when you could be shot at. You got to always be ready. Well, while at first I thought that was kind of silly, you know, the more I thought about it, I'm like, hey, this guy cares about his life. This guy in the day and world we live in cares about safety. He's going to go to extra precaution to preserve his life. The problem is some of us would laugh at that, wouldn't we? We'd be like, oh, man, you got on too much armor. You got on too much, man. You don't need that. The problem is that's how you approach your Christian life. You start to laugh at one another when it's like, hey, let's pray. Let's get in God's word. Let's realize there's a fight going on. And you're like, hey, man, hey, man this is Santa Clarita. Calm down. Calm down, man. We're on vacation. We're just kind of kicked back. Everything's cool. No, no, no. We need to have the mindset of, you know what? I better have my armor on. I better be ready at any time moment. As soon as you let up that Satan's fiery darts come straight at your heart to pierce you, we better have our armor on at all times. This leads us to our third heading, stand against the schemes of the devil. Your next blank is this, to stand is a defensive position. Notice again how verse 11 there in the middle, it says that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Did you know that that word stand is a military term that means hold your ground, hold your position? Interestingly enough, in this Ephesian spiritual warfare text, it never challenges us to charge ahead and take any new ground. I think that's because Christ has already taken the high ground. Salvation has already been accomplished. The war has been won. The battle still rages. That's day-to-day life as a Christian. But the war is over. Christ is the victor, and we are in the victory army of the Lord. Nevertheless, we are told to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
One place I think that we see this illustrated so powerfully is in 2 Samuel. Why don't you turn there with me? 2 Samuel in chapter 23. You'll, you'll remember this when you see it, but this is about the mighty man of David. You remember King David was being chased out of town by Saul, and he was uh, defending himself, and he was hiding in different places, and he had, uh, he had the best warriors on his side, and there's a list of men given that are called the mighty men, 30 of them, in fact. And in 2 Samuel chapter 23, Verse 8, we read this. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Now, you got to understand, these brothers had some bad names, but they could fight. All right? So you have Josheb Bashabeth, a Tachamanite. He was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. I told you these dudes were bad to the bone. All right? This guy takes 800 with his spear. Right, we're not talking about bombs and grenades and Rambo. You know, he's just mowing them down with his M16 and lots of weapons. Just a spear, 800. I mean, that would wear you out just to do like this with a spear 800 times. Verse 9, and next to him among the three men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ehoi. Just about the time you want to make fun of him, listen to what he does. He was with David. <laughs> He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory on that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. My man Dodo's after it, isn't he? Eleazar is getting in there. Everybody else wants to run. He kills them all. Everybody else just comes back to strip the dead. The work had been done because why? His hand was weary, but it clung to the sword. He was not letting go. He was not going to give up the fight, and he got the job done. Third one is this, and next to him was Shema, son of Agi, the Araharite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines and the Lord worked a great victory. You say, Adam, what's the big deal? He's just standing in a plot of lentils. He's in a field of beans for crying out loud. What's the big deal? The big deal is that was his inheritance. That was the promised land. He knew God had given them the land and he wasn't going to let it go. It may be a field of lentils to somebody else, but it's God's inheritance for you. And you be, better be ready to fight to protect your purity, to protect your marriage, to protect your children, to protect whatever it is that God has given you in this world. You be, be, better be ready to fight. And my friends, to other people, it seems overkill. We're getting a little bit too excited. Why do you have to be such a radical Christian? Can't we just kick back and coast? And the answer is no. You better be a mighty man, a mighty woman, ready to fight. The devil is coming after you. You must be ready to withstand. That's what this whole text is about. God gave this land to Israel. It was rightfully theirs, and yet the Philistines kept trying to take it away. You have been given the inheritance of salvation. Christ has conquered sin on your behalf. You are called to be a mighty man and a mighty woman of splendor and of valor and of courage. You are called to stand your ground to defeat the enemy. This is why Jesus said, I believe, in Revelation 2.25, that the seven churches of Revelation to the church of Thyatira, he said this, only hold fast what you have until I come. In other words, hold your ground, hold fast to what you have till I come. Hold on, church. Don't let go. Christ is coming back. But in the meantime, we better hold our ground. How are you doing? How are you doing holding your ground? Are you holding fast to your integrity? Are you defending the faith? Are you standing your ground? Because let me tell you something. The foe that we are up against is no walk in the park. He has many methods. That's your next blank. The schemes, actually, the schemes of the devil. In the original language, it's where we get our word methods from. But the schemes of the devil are deceptive and strategic. The word schemes can mean deceitful craftiness. The verb form scheming means to defraud, to deceive, or to pervert. This is not only 
found uh, here in this uh, spiritual warfare passage, the only other place it's found is in 414 that says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful, there's our word, schemes. The devil has many strategies. The devil has been working on his methods of deception for thousands of years. You believe in a conservative view of uh, six-day creationism, then we would say that the world is about 6,000 years old, which means Satan is a little bit older than that. Satan was created by God at some point. We know he existed prior to the fall of Genesis 3 because he comes as a serpent. So he's been around for a long time. He's had enough time to become an accomplished philosopher, theologian, psychologist, and entertainer. He knows what he's doing. I'm not that good in math. It was one of my favorite subjects in school, but I never kept up with it, uh, just as far as like calculus one, I think, in college. But if I worked really hard at math for like 100 years, I might be pretty good at it. If I were to work at it for a 1,000 years and I studied every learned theory there's to know about math, maybe I could be thought of as a Newton or an Einstein. What, what if I had 10,000 years to just work math? Think I'd be pretty good? Well, that's how long Satan's had to develop his schemes and his methods against the church of God. He knows exactly where your weakness is. He knows exactly how human nature works, and he's coming after you. He is a master of deception. He is a genius at confusion. He is brilliant in his brutality. He understands how to pull men down with women and with power and with gold. He knows how to attack women with fear, with intimidation, and with identity complexes. He is an expert in trapping our children into arguing, complaining, and selfishness. He is dominating this present age with role reversal, gender neutrality, and erotic liberty, unlike any time since Sodom and Gomorrah. Satan knows what he's doing. Do not underestimate your foe. There's no doubt about it. The devil knows his business. Do you know yours? Do you know how to study your opponent to defeat his schemes? Do you know how to fight the fight? The next blank is this. The devil is a slanderer and a fallen archangel. Those references there list the origin of the devil. Maybe I could just simplify by saying one commentator chronicles references to Satan throughout Scripture like this, quote, He was once the chief angel, the anointed cherub, the star of the morning, who sparkled with all the jewels of created beauty until he rebelled against his creator and tried to usurp his power and glory. He first appears in the Scripture in the form of a serpent as he tempted Adam and Eve. Jesus not only spoke about Satan, but he spoke with him. Paul, Peter, James, John, and the writer of Hebrews all speak of him as a personal being. We see him opposing God's work, perverting God's word, hindering God's servant, hindering the gospel, snaring the wicked, appearing as an angel of light, and fighting with the archangel Michael. He brought sin into the world, and he now has the whole world in his hands. The Bible refers to the devil by such personal names and descriptions as the anointed cherub, Ezekiel 28, the ruler of demons, Luke 11, the ruler of this world, John 16, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, and the prince of the power of the air here in Ephesians 2. He is identified as the great dragon, a roaring lion, the vile one, the tempter, the accuser, the spirit working in the sons of disobedience. 52 times he is called Satan, which means adversary, and 35 times he's referred to as the devil, which means slanderer. This fallen archangel and his fallen angels who became demons have been tempting and corrupting mankind since the fall. They are an evil, formidable, cunning, powerful, invisible foe against whom no human being in his own power and resources can match. Hopefully, you're trusting in the gospel. Because it's only Christ who can deliver you from the evil one. Only through the gospel can you overcome. Only through the gospel can you be victorious. Stand firm today, church, in the power of the cross and in the strength of our Lord. The fourth challenge to help you gear up for the battle would be this. You must know that we are called to wrestle against spiritual forces of evil. It's a wrestling match. 
verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Did you know this is the only place in the New Testament that the word wrestle is used? It can be translated as to struggle. The word indicates a close hand-to-hand combat. Due to the cunning, the cunning schemes of the devil, believers need to be ready for both remote and close-at-hand assaults. You must be ready to fight face-to-face at any moment. This is a war which every believer must be engaged. There is no hiding. There is no relief. There is no avoiding it. If you are in Christ, you are in Christ's war. And it's a nasty war. Again, you're not in the bunker pushing buttons, sending missiles out to other countries. This is a hand-to-hand combat. It will yield sweat. It will yield blood. It will yield exhaustion every day. We must fight the battle. If we're following Christ, we must follow his word. Who are we we up against? Well, we're against rulers. Your first blank under this point, we're fighting rulers. This means the first and principal ruler could be a reference to Satan himself. Also used in Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. There's a progression here in verse 12. Not only are we against rulers, which could be a reference to Satan or his archangels, but also B, the authorities. Coming down the chain of command would be the authorities. This word refers to to leaders in power. They're under the ruler because the ruler is governing it all, but they have authority over whoever they're over. The idea here is that these rulers and authorities are coupled together 10 times in the New Testament. Each time, it can refer either to a human or an angelic leader, oftentimes used in the case of spiritual warfare. It's used in 1 Peter 3.22. It says, who is referring to Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subject to him. The third force here is the cosmic powers of darkness. This particular word for darkness is used only here in the New Testament. This word is used in ancient literature to refer to pagan deities of the like of Helios, Hermes, and Serapis. These cosmic powers are not from this world, but operate in a spiritual world. Certainly, you might remember the reference to Daniel chapter 10, where he saw a vision of an angel who said to him, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and be humbled before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princesses, came to help me. I was left there with the kings of Persia. We understand we're fighting again against rulers and authorities, and we're fighting against these cosmic powers over this, uh, the, this present darkness. Right, the, the idea of this darkness also is referred to in Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. The last reference here is the spiritual forces of evil. The spiritual forces of evil. This last reference doesn't seem to be pointing to a new foe altogether, but further describes the hostile rulers already mentioned and points to their location. They're in the heavenly realms. There's a spiritual realm, meaning otherworldly. The root of the word spiritual forces is the word pneuma, where we get Holy Spirit from, or the word spirit, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. So it can either be a good spirit or a bad spirit. The word spirit is referred to as an evil spirit, an unclean spirit. And the idea is this is who we fight against. Now, you might ask the question, Adam, how do I know if I'm fighting the devil, if I'm fighting an authority, a ruler, an authority, a cosmic power, or if I'm just fighting some type of of evilness, evil force? And the answer is, you don't have to know. You fight them all the same. You put on the armor of God. You be engaged in the battle. It is not our job to discern necessarily which one is the devil, which one is a demon, or if it's just the lust of the flesh or the world. You may not know at any given moment what your foe exactly is, but you know you're called to fight. You're called to defend. You're called, number five, to resist in the evil day. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Your next blank here is you must take up the whole armor of God. 
repeated twice here, verse 11 and again in 13, whole armor, full armor, all of it, right? The, 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 the idea here is that you can't leave any part behind and when there are six pieces of armor we'll be looking at over the next six weeks to come and you'll see the value and the necessity of each piece and so here we're called to take up, this is actually in the active voice, take up the armor of God. You say, well, Adam, which one is it? Is it passive or is it active? Well, the passive idea is be strong in the Lord. He's going to strengthen you. The active idea is you still have a responsibility to take up arms. You take up arms. He does the defense because those weapons belong to God. But you have to take them up. There is an active component to being a soldier of Christ, 2 Timothy 2. Your next blank says this, you must resist the devil. If you're getting a little bit weirded out by this whole message, thinking I've gone charismatic on you, just remember James 4, 7 couldn't be more clear. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. This is a clear reference to you and I as Christians, our hand-to-hand combat with the devil. This is not for other people. This isn't for other forces in other countries where demonic activity is rampant. This is for every Christian to know you must fight. And as you submit yourself to God, you will be able to resist the devil and he will flee. Last, you must stand firm in the evil day. I believe the evil day is today. Every day that you fight is a day where good is versing evil. The spirit of God in you is fighting Satan, the world, and your flesh that is attacking against your new nature in Christ, which is why 1 Peter 5 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, same word, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. My brothers, you are not alone. This fight is going on all over this earth. Every country, every tribe, every Christian is called to take up arms and to stand their ground. There is no retreating. There is no relaxing. There is only fighting in the strength that God gives. You stay put. You hold your ground. You don't move. You rest in Christ. And as we continue this series, we'll be unpacking that more practically. Let's look at this last little take-home Thing that you can look at a little bit if you'd like. Number one, you will never defeat the devil in your own strength. How about just starting right there? Every moment of every day, you must call out to God, beg him for his help, be in his word, and put on his armor. Number two, you must hold your ground and never let go. I'm not asking you to charge out into the highways and byways looking for fights. I'm calling you to stand firm in your family and in your marriage and in this church and in our community and in your neighborhood, and you stand firm. Hold your ground. Last, you will need the armor of God to resist all the wiles of the devil. You need protection. It comes from God. It's God's armor. We're going to look at each piece of it as we head through the next six weeks together so that we can engage in this battle. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would help us as we realize this morning, maybe some of us for the first time, how serious the Christian life is. God, forgive us for those of us maybe who've had a little bit of a lay low, kick back, prop up your feet, enjoy the ride. God, help us rather to say, you know what, I'm going to rest in the finished work of the gospel because I know the war is over. Christ is one. He is the victor. But you know what, Lord, I pray you'd help me get up and get in a fight. I want to make sure I got on the breastplate and the belt and the helmet and the shield and the the shoes. God, I need to gird up my loins. I need to be ready. And as we look at all of this beautiful passage of warfare for the Christian soldier of Christ, I pray that you would wake us up, help us to engage in the battle, help us not to fall asleep, Help us to be aware of how to fight rightly and appropriately with the word of God. So I pray, God, that you would use this passage to shake us to the core. To help us fight for all that we care about, which we find in scripture. I pray, God, that you would do an incredible work through this series in this church. To turn our lives upside down. To change this church once and for all. 
to allow us to make a dent in the kingdom of darkness and to see the light of Christ shine forth from this church throughout this community. Do your work, God, in our hearts for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.